Hello, this is Joel Lindstrom, and I'm here with another Power Platform answer for you. I'm calling this Security Made Easier. I was going to call it Security Made Easy, but security always has some challenges, so I thought Made Easier sounded better. Today in the Power Users Forum, DanMan71 asked, My test user can see a custom entity, but they don't see the data. Do I need to give all users the common data service user role at the user level? It's a good question, Dan. And to understand this, you really need to understand the building blocks of security because there's a number of things to keep in mind. Let's start with security roles. So the base security tool is the security role. And general rule, users need a role to log into the system. Now, I put an asterisk by there because there's one main exception to that. Generally, a user can't log into the system if they don't have a role. And roles are cumulative. So whether they need the common data service user role or not is debatable because common data service user is a good base role, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have permissions for your custom entities. You have to go in and add those. Uh, and I recommend making a copy of the role. You always want to make a copy of the role. You never want to start from scratch. And I don't recommend re-modifying the standard roles either because Microsoft will updates and they will um, it, it's going to potentially overwrite what you do so always make a copy of the role never start from scratch um, I have some tips of the day around this at uh, CM tip of the day for power platform tips CM tip of the day two the very first one I wrote was use a base role that's the idea of you don't want every if you got multiple personas, you don't want every role to have, be a self-contained role because it's very cumbersome when you add things to it. Nine times out of ten, everybody needs the same permission or needs the same access. So use a base role. That's a role that everybody has that gives them the permission to log into the system. And then supplement that with niche roles that have just the additional permissions. Remember, roles are cumulative, so if you have three roles, in any area, you get the permission that is highest in any one area. And you can assign roles to teams, which we'll talk about later. Roles are also unique for a business unit. Now, you can create a, a role that is just at one business unit, but I don't recommend it because it's really easy to uh, get a very complex system that way. I recommend doing everything at the organization level, and that way all your business units will have a copy of the role. Let's look at the security role a little bit more. So the security role, if you go to security role, like the common data service user role, you'll notice it has the CRUD, the CRUD categories up on the top and the entities at the top. So this determines not only what entities you can access, but what records within the entity you can access. Because if you look at the key down here, you'll see this goes by the amount of pi you have in the pi. A single slice is user level. That means, for example, this role gives you create level for user level for accounts. That means I, with this role, I could create an account that I own, but I couldn't create one that's owned by somebody else. Same thing with read, write, delete, etc. cetera. Um, business unit limits it to the people in my business unit. So if I have business unit read and Mary is in my business unit, I can read what she has, and then um, if she has that same role, she can read what I have, but I can't read what somebody in another business unit has. Append and append to are the ones everybody misses up, so uh, I'll try and clarify that for you. Append and append to are two sides of the same coin. So if I have two entities that are related to each other, say accounts and contacts, if I want to append a contact to an account, I need append permission on the contact, meaning I want to relate a child to the parent. I need append on the child and append to on the parent. To talk about the different areas, the core records are things like accounts, contacts, the core records of the system. Down below, they have some general system settings. Um, marketing, you know, you won't see all these if you don't have Dynamics 365 apps in your entity or in your environment. You probably would not see marketing, sales, and service if you don't have Dynamics 365. Business management is some general categories, uh, not specific to any one entity, but more things like certain application behaviors. Um, and customization is the ability to, say, create personal views. Uh, I would not recommend you restrict it. Just go with the common data service user and go with the standard pieces that are there. Again, common data service user is a low impact role, so you're not generally going to be able to 
do anything. You can't customize anything or, or make any changes to the system with just the uh, common data service user role. Now let's talk about business units. Business units are the major groupings of users for security purposes. And remember that users can only be in one business unit. And one thing you want to be really careful about how you set this up because moving bit users between business units is a major pain. They lose their security roles, chances are they own some records, and when you move them, those records they own become associated with the new business unit. If, say, there's somebody who has activities or something related to one of the records that you owned, that can really cause some problems if they say they were in the middle of a sales process to them. I recommend having at least two business units. You will have just one business unit to begin with, but the problem is that what you decide to do at the beginning and what happens three years later are often not the same thing. So what will happen is we say, oh, we just need one business unit. But then what happens is then you have a scenario where you need to restrict things and have certain records that are only visible, say, to the HR group. If you only have the one business unit, you wind up having to move everybody or say you get acquired and have you know sensitive data that you need to have at a higher level. I recommend always putting everybody at a child business unit because the child business unit can always be reparented. I can always create a new business unit and make it the parent of it. Maybe you would put the uh, CEO at the top level, but everybody else should be in, at least in a child business unit. Remember that business units don't necessarily have to restrict people, though. If I don't give somebody a security role that doesn't have a restriction of the business unit, give them organization read, for example, the business units don't restrict anything. And... Keep in mind, the business unit has a team. So if you need to assign records to the business unit, you can assign it to the business unit team. That team automatically gets all the users in the business unit. I don't recommend assigning a high-level role to it, like system admin. That's caused a lot, of, a lot of issues where people have unintended consequences. And a couple of tips of the day, 917 and 935. One explains why you don't want too many business units. I've literally had people want to do a thousand business units and I caution them against it because the more business units you have, the slower things go, especially with making changes to security roles because there's a copy of each role at each business unit. To sales group, these group should be able to see their stuff, but we don't want them to see the financial data that's owned by the big wigs. But, and the big wigs, they should be able to see everything the sales team does. So this is how we set it up. Again, I don't put anybody in the root except for maybe very senior people. So I have a big wig and a business unit here, and I have a sales business unit here. The sales team has business unit read on their stuff. They might have user level read on some things, for example, opportunities. They might not want each other stealing, stealing their opportunities. But for other stuff like accounts, they can see everything the business unit. But they, they can't see things above this. So the big wigs, they could have organization level read or they could have parent-child business unit. Either one of those would work. Parent-child basically means I can see what's at my business unit or below that. So maybe we have between here, we've got a legal or HR and they've got really sensitive contacts or other information. That gives us the flexibility to have data that's secret without having to you know, go through a lot of hoops. We can basically organize this. The biggest mistake I see people make here is they try and mimic their organization chart. They try and have a business unit for every department. You don't need that because a lot of times sales, service, etc., will have very similar permissions or, or be able to need to see each other's stuff for collaboration. So really use business units only for security purposes, not for other groupings. For the other types of groupings, that's what Teams is for. So Teams is a more flexible grouping of users. Unlike business units, you can have as many teams as you want. You can be a member of multiple teams. And the beautiful thing is teams can cross business units and they can own records if there are certain types of teams and they can have security roles. So what this all means is I can have my main major thing, think, big rock pillar business units and that are the, the normal division of how we do business. But then I've got certain customers that are managed by cross 
business teams that need special permissions on those. That's what owner teams are for. So I can have a team that owns the records that should be worked on cross business unit. Their security role in the team only gives that the people on the team those permissions in context of the team. It doesn't necessarily elevate their permissions outside the team. And there's a classic blog post written by uh, by Adam Vero. It, if you Google it, you probably you'll find it. Security roles and teams: an inconvenient half truth. This is the classic blog post. I've never seen anything better explaining how owner team security works. It's not truly inherited security. People think, oh, if I have the sales manager team and I give this team, uh, give this team sales manager role, that gives it, gives everybody that permission over everything, and that's not the case. So read that and understand. That's why I'm super excited about the latest addition to Teams, which is the Active Directory and Office 365 group team. Now, the Active Directory and Office 365 group team has a couple of really great benefits. One is, as you'll see here, it ties to an Active Directory security group. And the great thing about that is many enterprise companies want to manage their users and access to applications that way. They already are doing it. They've already got an AD security group for each of those departments, and this makes it super easy to not have to do anything else. You can, you can not only have them automatically become a user, but you can automatically have them get the role, and that role can be the same as if you assigned a role right to them. So it's a way to totally automate, and you know a lot of things that get that happen when somebody new is onboarded. It's easy to forget something if somebody has to remember go in and add a role to them. And one thing that confuses people, it confused me the first time I used it, is I set this up, and then I looked at the team, and nobody was there. And I thought, oh, we got to wait for it to sync. I waited until the next day. Nobody was there. Then I noticed in small print on the on the uh, blog or on the uh, docs article about it, the users don't show up until they log in the first time. Then when they log in, it checks their team membership, and if they have one of these teams, then they can get in. And there's this other thing called Office 365 group teams. They're functionally the same. The difference is an Active Directory security group has to be uh, managed by an Active Directory administrator or global administrator, where Office 365 groups are, are able to be managed by people who are not administrators. So in, in other words, if you want to have this functionality, but you don't have the permission to manage an Active Directory security group, you can also use an Office 365 group team. Now there's one critical thing different about security roles that you need to know. So, uh, and that is traditionally, as I mentioned, and this is covered with Adam Burrow's classic blog post, that uh, you, the owner roles don't work as true inherited roles. There's now a change you can make at the beginning of, at the first tab of a security role. And that lets you change it to say, when this role is assigned to a team, let the member inheritance function as direct user access and team privileges. So that basically is saying that if the Active Directory Security Group team has this role and this setting is set to direct user basic, it functions exactly the same as if you directly assign a role to those users. And so the beautiful thing with that is you don't have to do anything. You simply add the people to the, to the team. They instantly become have access to the system. They instantly get the role or roles and the team and, and the business unit assignment that you associate with that team. So that's a beautiful thing. And so I think we should go back and amend this little formula that we had here where we said business unit plus role equals access. That still is true. That is, if you just give somebody business unit, that's not going to necessarily enforce any restriction. If you give them a role, but everybody's in the same business unit, that doesn't enforce any restriction. But the combination of these two things together equals what access I get. But we'll add to that plus team membership. Because again, your team might have a role, and that role could give you access either as an owner team that has access to role to, to records which the team owns or has shared with them, or as an active directory security team, which gives people roles through there that function more as individual roles 
And there's other types of teams like access team that give ad hoc record access. So there's a number of things you, you need to take in. We didn't even talk about sharing, hierarchical security, other things like that. But hopefully, DanMan71, this answers your question and gives you a little bit more information so that you can, you can identify why your users might not be seeing the missing information in their Power App.